This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. On the heels of a long weekend, it is Tuesday, August 2nd. Jesperson here with Hicks. It's a beautiful August morning, a little, sure little, bit, uh, little bit overcast in our neck of the woods. I wonder if people might be hearing this in the afternoon, the evening, or six months from now. You never know. That's the beauty of podcasts, and a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is what they might call evergreen content. In other oh. words, it's going to be interesting and valuable and worth your consumption without an expiry date. Uh, but we do appreciate, of course, those of you that are joining us live and uh, we've got a great week in store here on the show. We're going to be talking to conservative leadership candidate Jean Charest on the heels of the debate that's going to go down tomorrow evening. That'll be Wednesday evening. Here's the thing, though. A couple of, well, one very high profile and a couple of relatively high profile candidates are not participating in that debate. So it's, it's got a bit of a different vibe to it. I'm sure that the candidates that are showing up to participate are probably wishing that there was more talk about who is living up to their part of the bargain who is avoiding the fifty thousand dollar fine by participating but uh regardless it makes it part of the story so jean Chere, later this week we're going to be talking to former bc premier christy clark that's going to be tomorrow morning today we're going to get to a story that people across the country and probably around the world are looking at and going what the hell is that? She's a leadership candidate for Alberta's United Conservative Party. She wants to be Alberta's next premier. Of course, we're used to talking politics with Leela here. But this morning, yeah, we'll talk a bit of politics. We're going to talk about her literally staring down a bull. She literally, literally grabbed a bull by the horns this weekend at the Chestermere Stampede. She's going to be joining us in about a half an hour to talk about it. the Strathmore Stampede. Pardon me. The Strathmore Stampede. Stampede. Uh, they've got their annual running of the bulls event. What could possibly go wrong? Johnny, can we roll this video? This is remarkable stuff. I'll, I'll narrate it for those of you that are listening on the podcast. This captured on, on somebody's phone. You're going to see Leela here. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see her. she's the one that jumps over the fence. I'm, I can laugh and chuckle because everybody's OK. Minus some bumps and bruises. The guy that was you know, I mean, in, in a position to potentially get gored, he was not. Uh, he had some road rash. He had some bumps and bruises, but they say he was at the cabaret later that night <laughs> having a couple cold ones to forget about it all, maybe to make himself feel a little bit better. But everybody's OK, maybe and probably due in part to the quick thinking of Leela here. Here's how it all went down this weekend. This is wild stuff at the Strathmore Stampede. Check it out. So the bull's on its way. Out until it isn't turns on a dime does a 180 and just gets into a guy takes him down to the ground and he's taking great interest in it and right there in the cowboy hat and the red shirt the jeans that's Leela here that's the, the the MLA for the area who jumps in there literally puts her hands on his horns and gets the bull out of there everybody's cheering it's it's a good news outcome kind of a thing but but pretty wild stuff uh, I was reading most of the comments online and people are just going, I, I saw one from uh, Luke Fevin who chimed in on this. He's, he says, forget politics. He says that took stones. Unbelievable stuff. You ever seen a video like that? I've never seen something like that in my life. And I heard, I actually heard on the radio this morning, she like black, she doesn't remember that, that at that point, she just remembers the bull coming over to the gate and that was it she she did a couple of newspaper interviews where she said she thought it was just like her mama instinct like what prompted her to jump over the rail to get there to stand in front of this mm. bull i'm not sure like just to state the obvious but if you've ever been up close to one of these animals it, it's hard to describe how enormous they are and not just how enormous they are but how they're built and when they're pissed off it's an even I mean, the, the intimidation factor is off the charts. Totally huge. <laughs> so anyway, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Of course, we'll probably ask her about some of the political stuff that's happening too. her, her, her fellow candidates. If you want to call them that her, her opponents in this leadership race, uh, it seems to be a race in, in a few different directions. You probably noticed uh, good morning, everybody, by the way, joining us outside of Alberta. We're going to keep it local here a little bit. Uh, it's obviously an area of interest in our neck of the woods and probably 
across Canada as well, considering that this leadership race will culminate with with Alberta's next premier. So it's a bit of a big deal. You know, one of these Western provinces that typically makes a bit of noise on the national stage has a relevant economy, uh, you know, a growing population. People pay attention to what happens in Alberta, maybe not as much as Albertans want, but Mm -hmm. they still pay attention. And so uh, Daniel Smith, you know, has been talking about this Sovereignty Act, this Alberta Sovereignty Act, says that Alberta is going to essentially reserve the right to pick and choose which federal laws it'll obey. Danielle says we want to be a little bit more like Quebec. We want to manage more of our own affairs and we'll involve Ottawa when we see fit. Well, everybody's been wondering, where's Brian Jean in all of this? What's Brian Jean's plan? And as we were heading into the long weekend, he started talking about this kind of stuff. He's, he's basically kind of doubling down and saying Danielle doesn't go far enough. He's saying Danielle's going to wait. Danielle's going to take a passive approach to this. He says, we're going to challenge the federal government in the courts. Alberta's going to. So we're going, OK, so we'll get Leela's take on, on where this race is going. I don't know if this is good for Albertans. <laughs> it's good for poly watchers. It's good for people that are, you know, pundits in the business of punditry. Uh, maybe we'll ask Bob Murray about this, Dr. Bob, when he joins us next. He's coming on to talk foreign policy. He probably doesn't want to mix it up in provincial politics. We're going to talk to Bob Murray in just a little bit. And of course, we'll ask Leela here about this bonus that was paid to Alberta's chief medical officer of health has just surfaced. Great reporting by Janet French, an investigative or, or a journalist with the CBC, uh, showing that Alberta's chief medical officer of health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw. This is always weird, isn't it? When people's salaries are getting s- spread out for, for, for public consumption with, yeah. without a lot of context. Well, and, we're in public office, you know, part of a team, it happens. But yeah, I heard it. Too, this like, weekend check and I this was out like, I mean, what i was just i was like looking at her contract online you can find her employment agreement it's available so i didn't do any digging i'm not revealing anything that anybody can't find themselves but like you know her her basically the only thing that's redacted on this entire deal uh on this entire contract is whoever who witnessed it that's mm-hmm. the only detail that's redacted here but it talks about her salary it talks about the terms of her employment so it's it surfaced this weekend the story that she collected three hundred sixty four thousand. Uh, annually it's yeah. a good salary in 2021 she's the chief medical officer of health uh, but she collected a bonus uh, a bonus of more than a quarter million dollars 228 grand so yeah, the total was... salary is you know right around 600k uh, and these are bonuses as we understand it not determined by her not determined by jason kenny in particular people are going to say i'm already the way i'm phrasing this i'm sounding like an apologist <laughs> i just want us to have all of the details so yeah. i want us to understand it fully uh, but but the, the, the formula determines uh, bonus pay or extra salary for any week where she works more than 48 hours, 45 hours. Oh, okay. Any week where she works more than 45 hours, she gets a bonus. And, and the formula based on her COVID workload worked out to about 600 grand for 2021. But three quarters of your salary as a bonus, it seems a bit... Uh, <laughs> I mean, when, when like and i know the argument out there is you know nurses mm-hmm. are getting cuts and doctors, doctors don't, have contract. don't have contract signs so yeah. it, i can see why there's an uproar she wasn't the only one that got a bonus or i think they're about 106 or something like that just over 100 people that got a bonus in total uh but the, that much? the cost to the government was will be about 2.4 million dollars which which is a lot of money if you're an individual and if you're talking about the health budget or the overall provincial budget 2.4 million is nothing um buddy they lose four billion right <laughs> they, they don't even know where they put the four billion for 2.4 million are you can i found that along with the lint in my pocket but oh, uh, so people have different things to say about it i saw some 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 political voices chiming in on this you've heard dr Dwayne brad on this show before of course out of calgary's mount royal university and i i thought that dr Dwayne had a, a solid take on this he didn't just pile on the chief medical officer of health but he did make a good observation which i thought was worth pointing out he said he said uh, i'm okay with this he says the high profile role that that Hinshaw played, chief medical officer of health and the additional weekly hours of work, uh, the calculation, which is almost unimaginable. He says that she dedicated to addressing an unprecedented health crisis. It justifies a bonus. And same with the 106 other individuals, says Dr. Brad. But he says this is going to be a bomb tossed in the middle of the UCP leadership campaign. Danielle Smith's campaign, plus Brian Jean, plus Todd Lowen has attacked the Kenny government's COVID response. He says, I expect that Hinshaw will now be a target. And Travis Taves, who was the finance minister at the time, will be forced to defend the bonuses. He says also, the bloom is clearly off Hinshaw's rose. Nobody wears her T-shirts anymore. She was a cult hero at the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, these critics will say she was paid off 
to support the Premier, to support Jason Kenney. Hinshaw's bonus will be contrasted, and it's fair comment, it'll be contrasted with Dr. Verna Yu, who was fired as the CEO of Alberta Health Services. And I think that that's a storyline that people are going to pay attention to. And I think that it's fair game, uh, fair commentary. So she's in a tough spot because, uh, I mean, she's not going to comment on this, no way. Uh, she won't, I would imagine, make herself available to the media to talk about this. Why would she? Uh, people are going to forget about this probably two weeks from now. That doesn't mean it's not worth our discussion. It doesn't mean it's it's not worth uh, an investigation by journalists who are doing their good job to determine how the power structure uh, you know, works out and, and, and where the money goes and who's being overlooked and who's being topped up. I mean, that's fair commentary, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I do think it's relevant to suggest, and I'm not going to sit here and defend, like, I don't know if, if the salary is worth 600. I don't know if, you know, I mean, she's already one of the top paid docs in the country. It's been pointed out that other chief medical officers of health in other provinces were not paid bonuses at all. Mm -hmm. In some circumstances, they were. Dr. Hinshaw's salary in Alberta, substantially more than Dr. Teresa Tam, all right, her federal counterpart, right? Um, Also, they say that, you know, salaries in certain parts of the country are more. And typically, Alberta's salaries have been higher. And uh, the cost of living in, Al- living in Alberta is, is sometimes a little bit lower, which is why a lot of people want to move to Alberta. My brother and his wife were here this weekend visiting. They live in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. You should have seen their face. This beautiful house just sold a couple of blocks north of us. Really, really great house. And, and uh, I said, we're walking the dogs. I said, you want to know how much that house sold for? She's like, no. <laughs> She's like, all right, hit me with it. How much did it sell for? I said, well, they listed it for six ninety nine. She's get out of here. She was pissed. They were pissed off. Wow. You know, in a funny way. Live in Vancouver. <laughs> I think that's like your down payment. Six ninety nine is your down payment in Vancouver. So salaries have typically been higher in Alberta. So, so you know, I mean, you, you don't blame the individual for signing a contract, a plum offer. You don't blame it if somebody wants to pay me a whole bunch to do something. I'm not going to say no. You know, they're going to top me up with my bonus. I, I guess I'm going to take it, but it's a tough look, isn't it? When you look at all the other, I mean, people are going to say, I'm a respiratory therapist, and people were spitting on me and throwing things at me when I was walking into the hospital, you know, denied overtime, denied vacation requests, forced to come in and work overtime shifts, and then she's getting a bonus? We don't know all the inside details, but if I'm still, you know, channeling this respiratory therapist, I might also be feeling that maybe the government and Dr. Hinshaw's response wasn't actually all that great. If you take a look at the rest of the country and the reputation that Alberta earned through a lot of this, and she's getting bonused and I'm not, lands a little bit differently from that perspective, right? Dr. Ubakog Bogu says the, the criticisms are surely fair commentary because the government told us that there was austerity and the government basically slashed everything, even disability benefits. Remember the government de-indexing age? That was mm-hmm. one, just one thing, right? He says they could have easily stopped the extra pay formula. Easily you got to start with the top sometimes if you want to maintain or earn public favor. True. Dr. Ogbogu goes on to say it's a very bad look to be defending extra compensation for fat cats in a year. Nobody says that anymore. That's such a good phrase. <laughs> it is a throwback. <laughs> defending extra compensation for fat cats in a year where so many healthcare workers worked more hours but had their salaries frozen or even cut. He says, I'm pretty sure Dr. Teresa Tam worked similar or even more hours. No bonus there. Only in Alberta. That from Dr. Ubaka Ogbogu out of the University of Alberta. Let us know what you think. Talk at RyanJesperson.com. Dr. Bob Murray coming up in one minute. Before we get to him, I want to remind you that our friends at Apex Automation are always, always hiring. When they can find an engineer, one of the best in the country, they're going to make the best pitch they can to add that engineer to their team based out of Edmonton, Alberta, but doing work literally around the world. Apex is providing intuitive, fully autonomous solutions to industry. They're giving people back their time. That's their clients, but that's also their employees. They've got a flexible hour formula. They want you to be happy. They want you to find that balance, professional development opportunities. Who doesn't want those? Plus their corporate culture. That's something they really celebrate and strive to improve year over year every year at apex automation also big shout out to our friends at friesen brothers did you see this on august 16th it's world bratwurst day so they're getting really excited about this we made brunch this weekend with ivan's sausages yeah well we had the out-of-towners and we wanted to make sure that they were aware Mm -hmm. of what some of the best butchers in the province can do well ivan's sausages these are actually created by ivan fano who's a legendary friesen brothers butcher out of hannah alberta they're made 
made fresh in every one of Friesen Brothers' 16 stores across the province. You can find them online at Friesen.com. Shout out to everybody who made it out for 15% off on the first of the month yesterday. Saving yourself some dough along the way. You've probably seen the news internationally speaking. The United States carrying out a drone strike, uh, killing top Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al zahari At one point, he was the physician, personal physician for Osama bin Laden. This about 11 years after the U.S. took out the man who essentially orchestrated the September 11th attacks. Saying President Biden addressing the nation just last night, quote, justice has been delivered and this terrorist leader is no more we're going to be talking about canada's foreign policy with dr bob murray but of course this is one of the stories leading the headlines dr bob and i go way back he's a political scientist and international relations expert based in edmonton a senior fellow at the mcdonald laurier institute he's published a number of books and articles on canadian foreign policy including most recently the palgrave handbook of canada in international affairs uh, dr bob was across our radar just a couple of days ago with his new piece in the hub.ca with global threats rising canada's lazy foreign policy is a growing vulnerability he's making his uh debut on real talk this morning bob we see this news out of the u.s out of kabul technically and of course as canadians we always want to understand things through our context through our lens now, what does this mean for canada i'm reading your piece in the hub a few days ago and you assert that canada is adrift and time is running out you've been very critical about how canada has approached its own foreign policy and communicating its international priorities what prompted you to actually put pen to paper and write this column what was it about canada that's that has you so agitated about how our drift nature yeah i'm I'm not sure agitated is the word i think more than anything else it's concern Uh, i think we've been watching this for quite some time this isn't a new phenomenon where we see canada really not having a coherent international strategy and Canadians really should be expecting more of their federal government and being able to articulate a very clear vision as to what Canada's role in the world is going to be. I think there's new pressure on being able to do a comprehensive review of our historical rule versus where we want to go. As we see broader changes in the the world order, we see the rise of new powers, we see the ongoing decline of the U.S. and relative decline of the U.S. in terms of its power position internationally. And it's really insufficient, in my opinion, for Canada to simply rest on its laurels to say that, you know, back in the 60s, uh, we were peacekeepers, uh, that we have played roles in different international conflicts throughout uh, modern history, and so that we should be fine, as long as we keep cozying up to the states. And I think what we've started to see is as the world shifts, the pressure on Canada becomes what what does Canada actually want to be doing? What are the values we want to be carrying out to the world? What are the norms and those values that we want to project and be able to try to facilitate in other parts of the world? And more than that, how also are we going to go about protecting our national interests and our national security? And I think what we have seen over time is that erosion in clarity on what Canada's foreign policy positions and international strategy positions are going to be. And as the world continues to shift and we see the rise of new threats, which means new vulnerabilities, we still have not seen our federal government be able to articulate exactly what that vision is going to be for how uh, Ottawa and how the federal government and our foreign policy are going to work towards uh, achieving our national interests while protecting our national security. And so I think putting pen to paper was about raising the alarm bells again. This isn't the first time that I've said these kinds of things, but I think this one seems to have hit home a little closer based on what we have seen over the last couple of years with Canada's foreign policy, what we are seeing from our current federal government uh, in terms of a foreign policy that is far more about uh, being reactionary, far more about domestic political consumption, far more about photo ops, uh, frankly, than it is substance on the world stage. And this isn't just a a commentary on, you know, taking a look at what is happening in Ottawa. I know the piece, uh, the Trudeau trolls were out in full force uh, accusing me of being partisan, but this is something that's been happening for decades. But I think it's hitting in real, real time here based on the shifts that we have seen internationally. We've seen some real time examples of where we have really blown it when it comes to our foreign policy, which I talk about in the piece, as well as the fact that there are things that we need clarity on and as the world continues to shift. You know, as Russia has uh, invaded 
Ukraine and that war continues, there's a lot of questions about what this means for the Arctic, for instance, in terms of the collapse of the cooperative around the Arctic Council and the cooperation that was taking place with Russia in the high north, what this means for Canada's NATO defense spending, where even though the federal government has promised money, we're still well below the 2% target that NATO has requested. And we still see a Canadian government not taking national defense as seriously. Now, to be clear, I care less about an arbitrary spending target as I do about sub a substantive defense policy where we actually know what Canada's defense strategy and policy is going to be moving forward and that we're going to spend money to make sure that we're actually achieving a higher level of national security than just saying to NATO that we're spending for the sake of spending. But these things are happening in real time. And as the world becomes more complex and a new order where we have more than one power dominating the international system, it places greater strain on Canada to have to figure out what that what its plan is going to be and what its positions are going to be and frankly part of that has to be diversifying away from simply relying on the u.s we still need a relationship with the u.s we know that's going to be our primary defensive and economic political foreign policy relationship but we do need an independent course for canada and to be able to articulate what that is and right now we're unable to do that what do you think is the biggest threat to canada's national security right now well, I think as we see emerging powers start to rise in the international order, we've started to see some very aggressive behavior. I think what we're seeing in Ukraine right now is perfect evidence of that. That's not the only evidence. And what I think we're unable to say as Canada is what would we commit to not commit to? Where exactly do we want to play a role and not play a role? What are our vital national interests that we want to be pursuing globally? And where do we draw the line and say that might not be a role for Canada? And right now we have no clarity on that. And we do have vulnerabilities, of course. I mentioned what's going on in the Arctic. And I don't believe Russian troops are coming over, you know, Baffin Island tomorrow. But I do believe that it's something that we have to take incredibly seriously. We have seen states being more aggressive in their Arctic posturing. And now we see an, a significant Arctic nation showing that it is willing to use military force to pursue its national interests. We're also seeing threats rising from elsewhere. We're also seeing cybersecurity and cyber threats becoming more and more prevalent and needing to be in incorporated into our national security and defense strategies. So as these threats continue to rise, other states, other actors are not going to simply stop while Canada tries to figure itself out. And what we're finding is that that gap between our ability to clearly and uh, strategically navigate the world order is falling further and further behind as other states are becoming more and more serious and aggressive about pursuing their interests in a changing world order. Is a UN Security Council seat kind of like an ego thing? Like when a, when a country like Canada loses a Security Council seat, is that like a Canadian city losing an NHL team? I mean, how, what are the terms you'd use? Why is it so important, do you think? I think what that, first of all, it sent a message to the rest of the world that we're not terribly serious uh, about an issue like that. You don't mount a campaign for a UN Security Council seat on the back of a napkin. So it affects our international credibility and legitimacy. Uh, having a seat at the table at one of the world's most important tables to me has incredible strategic, diplomatic, political and foreign policy value. And while it wouldn't be a veto vote, why it's not a permanent seat, I understand that, but I still believe that having a seat at the table and being able to engage with the world's most powerful states on the core issues affecting geopolitics especially for a state like Canada that historically has bragged, quite frankly, about our role as a middle power and the things that we have been able to pursue and achieve internationally, for us to have been so cavalier about that campaign sent a message to the rest of the world about just how serious Canada actually is right now about its foreign policy. And bear in mind that multilateralism and the use of international institutions like the UN has been a cornerstone of Canadian foreign policy since the end of World War II. That's one of the ways that we have subsidized our relative lack of military power and one of the ways that we've pursued what being a middle power actually means on the world stage is using these institutions to really heighten our position and take advantage of them. So by approaching an, an issue like a poten potential UN Security Council seat in the way that we did sent a really clear message, I think, to the rest of the world that, hey, you know, Canada isn't a terribly serious foreign policy player right now. They're not really terribly serious about their strategy and what it is they want to be doing. And certainly uh, in terms of just evaluating the the effectiveness of our foreign policy, if that's our approach to a seat on the UN Security Council, then there are broader questions to be asked. Now, in fairness, 
after that embarrassment, and I do believe it was a, an international diplomatic embarrassment, there were some shifts that took place uh, within our foreign policy structure, which led to the appointment of Bob Ray as ambassador to the UN. And I would argue that Bob Ray, as our UN ambassador, has been the lone highlight of Canadian foreign policy in recent months. I think he's doing a very good job, and he's been very effective at the UN. But our foreign policy and our foreign policy doctrines can't be announced in New York before they're announced in Ottawa. And so it's something that we have to take seriously in trying to figure out exactly what we're going to be pursuing moving forward. But I would also say that the UN Security Council seat situation really opens up our eyes as to how other states are pursuing and other middle powers are pursuing their foreign policies. And I think one of the most effective middle powers that we can look at right now on the world stage is Ireland. Uh, that's part of the reason why, you know, as back as far back as 2017, I was pushing for a an Alberta Ireland corridor on trade and investment because of how serious Ireland had become as a global player. Look how well Ireland navigated the Brexit situation. Look at how Ireland has navigated itself uh, at the UN and pursued its foreign policy goals and been very effective in some of the traditional roles that Canada has played. And so, where we choose not to take things seriously, other states will fill the void and become more serious players at our expense. Bob, I know that you, like, you, you don't want to sort of dumb down your commentary to where I want to take it here. Uh, but, is, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hey, we've been doing this for years, pal. It's like uh, I'm the yin to your yang or whatever you want to call it. But, but like for the average person, the person on the street, which really, like it or not, is what a lot of politicians care about or care about most, uh, maybe these aren't priorities. Maybe the average person that's walking down the street in Winnipeg or Hamilton, you know, or Lethbridge right now doesn't really care about a seat on the Security Council. They don't really care if Canada is asserting itself on the international stage. To be, you get what I'm saying? Maybe they don't care if our spending on NATO is at 1.65 instead of 2 percent, what have you. And maybe their MP or maybe their prime minister or, or for that matter, any other elected representative, maybe they get the sense that that is the case and they want to get reelected and they want to appear like you said about these domestic or I can't remember what you called them but domestic political priorities uh you things you know being most concerned about how things are going to play here maybe that's what the politicians care about too and, and maybe ultimately that's just the way that it goes uh, can you draw a line between the person on the street to the decisions that are happening you know in parliament yeah absolutely I think the, and you're absolutely right historically Canadians have very clearly not cared nearly as much about foreign policy and defense policy as other policy issues especially domestic policy issues because most people associate directly with what they see and experience on a daily basis our MPs are elected by a domestic constituency and of course the MPs are going to want to get re-elected on showing tangible benefit to people's lives within Canada so of course most of these things are for domestic political consumption but people start to care about foreign and defense policy when something goes wrong. They also actually are looking to the federal government, even inadvertently, even without knowing it, that the way that we pursue our diplomatic, our political, our economic and military interests internationally affect life at home on a daily basis. Physical security is made vulnerable by us not pursuing a better international strategy. Look at the reaction uh, within Canada to what happened with one day without Rogers. And that was not a cyber attack, but one day without Rogers. Imagine a coordinated comprehensive cyber attack against Canada where we weren't ready and our infrastructure wasn't ready to be able to cope with it. When we weren't even able to cope as a nation with one day outage of one uh, major telco. Um, so I think that's a really good example. If we actually draw lines as to where we're vulnerable, uh, we take a look at that. Canadians ultimately benefit from things like free trade agreements, where our cost of living right now, everybody's talking about things like inflation, the possibility of a recession. All of those things are also impacted by our foreign policy, our foreign economic policy, our trade policies, who we're able to do business with and who's willing to actually do business with us in the world. And in, in order to enter into conversations around things like free trade agreements or defense agreements that keep us safer, we have to be a credible nation. We have to be perceived to be serious. And so while on a daily basis, when you're going to get your coffee and walking down the street and and bemoaning the, the state of potholes on Edmonton roads, uh, for instance, you might not think very much about why does the Security Council seat matter? 
until something goes wrong. And we have shown in the past that, of course, Canada does step up at times when it absolutely has to, and we have involved ourselves in certain things. But the greater distance between our understanding of those global impacts on a daily basis and the direct line of sight to Canadians' lives is also, in my opinion, a failing of successful, su successive federal governments to be able to clearly delineate for people why these things matter. And if things don't matter to the federal government, if we're going to pursue things in an ad hoc, reactive way, why should we expect Canadians themselves to care? Do you have any reason to believe that this would be demonstrably different with another political party at the helm, Bob? Like, do you think that the previous prime minister, we're talking like pre-2015, you think Stephen Harper did a better job on any of this? I mean, Security Council seat included, foreign policy, spending on NATO. I mean, these were all similar complaints under the previous party, previous prime minister, right? Yeah, these have been, I would say that uh, these, uh, my analysis anyway, would be that we've been having this problem really since the Mulroney era. Uh, and so it's been successive governments. I don't see it as a strictly partisan issue. I think the Chrétien government and the Harper government, I don't mean to skip over Paul Martin, but it was kind of a blip. Um, you know, those those governments articulated certain values and certain interests. We did hear the articulation of a principled foreign policy doctrine during the Harper era. We saw talk about Arctic sovereignty during the Harper government, for instance, but we never really saw what was actually going to be done to take that seriously. And other than, again, photo ops in, up in the high north. And so this has been something for some time that has been a problem for Canadians. You know, and we have seen studies done that many Canadians still believe that our, our legacy in foreign policy is that we're still a peacekeeping nation when we have not been a substantive peacekeeper for decades. And so really, we have seen an issue with regard to how people are understanding and getting their information about Canada's role in the world. But more than that, by not having done a comprehensive review of our international strategy and doing that, that review properly that would engage Canadians, we do have people with a number of anecdotal assumptions about the way that we do things in the world or what we're involved in or not. Uh, and really fail to understand, I think, the role that we could be playing and what's available to us. And and also, I think why this matters right now in an era of misinformation and disinformation, Ryan, is you know right now we have political parties and political leaders standing up and saying that the World Economic Forum is controlling Canadians and making major decisions about our lives. And the conspiracy theories are able to foster and spread in the absence of real information. And that does matter in terms of our engagement on the global stage. I mean, having been to some of these meetings, you go to a World Economic Forum or any other global forum, they can't agree on a lunch order, let alone a conspiracy to control people. So I think these things absolutely matter right now and what we're seeing even from our domestic political discourse. Don't let word get out that you're at World Economic Forum meetings, pal. It'll bury you. I mean, serious trouble around here. That's where they, that's where they put my microchip in. Yeah, not a boy. No, seriously, man, careful. You can't say shit like that anymore. Dr. Bob Murray, Senior Fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute. It's nice to have you on the show, Bob. Nice to see your face again. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, me. buddy. Thanks. You can let us know what you think to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Oh, boy. Microchip to the World Economic Forum. He's got the Klaus Schwab stamp. <laughs> We laugh, but someone's going to be like, I heard about it on Real Talk. He's a friend of George Soros. He's a friend of George Soros. He's on the take. No, I get people. It, I mean, people would probably swing the other way. But Bob mentioned, he said his critics came out, the the, the Trudeau loyalists or whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, people that, that sort of maybe felt like his take on this was partisan, which may very well be the case. Whether mm -hmm. he likes it, that's fine. I mean, people have partisan takes on things. That's fine. But he says, you know, he describes, again, the ongoing disinterest in achieving NATO spending targets. That's true. Um, that's been under many, or not many, but several prime ministers. Empty rhetoric, he says, from the PM or foreign affairs minister. A futile campaign for a U.N. Security Council seat. Again, a nonpartisan reality. Uh, or largely, he says, ignoring core strategic interests like Canada's Arctic. You think the average Canadian is has that on their radar as Canada's Arctic sovereignty or like, you know, whether how much of that... Uh, and I'm not dismissing it as as unimportant. It's not, but it's. It, I don't think it's on a lot of people's radar. Like no. if the federal, yeah, if the federal government's like we're going to spend 11.4 billion over the next three years to increase Canada's footprint, securing our claim and title to the Arctic. Like, do you think that the average Canadian, I don't think that so. that can't, you know, doesn't have dental coverage and they want a national pharmacare program and they want. Do you think that like not they want to see green homes grants and solar yeah. and they want to see better transit infrastructure? Like, do you think that? But then Bob's right to point out, like, you know, Russia's demonstrated in the last year that 
when it feels like doing something, it'll do something. Mm-hmm. I get the sense the Americans would, and the, like this is, I mean, like it or not, you know, the Americans would probably take it pretty seriously if the Russians started fighting over the Arctic, you know, and then we probably just feel like, well, the Americans have our backs. That's the average lay person's take on this. I'm not saying it's right. I know that the policy wonks will be rolling their eyes so hard they're getting migraines right now, but what people care about matters to politicians. That's what we try to point out on this show. That's one of the things we got to pay attention to. Speaking to politicians, we're going to talk to one in just a second. But you know, it's not like it's not like sports reporting or political coverage where we use a bunch of metaphors. You know, she grabbed the bull by the horns. No, Leela here literally grabbed a bull by the horns this weekend in an effort to stop a guy from getting killed. And uh, the good news is the guy didn't get killed. So Leela's going to tell us that story in just a second. I can't wait for this. <laughs> I tell you, I love when animals attack. And people survive. When animals attack. You know, I don't want people to get hurt, but it's great to see, you know, them fighting back a little. And it's bullfighting is the one you always see where you're like, this is just, come on. And this is you the, asked for this. This is like the running of the bulls, <laughs> yeah. right? This is just people, right? Yeah. I wasn't there. I'm going to get her to tell the story. I didn't witness it. I wasn't there. She's smiling right now. She's ready. But it's in, like in Pamplona, like in Spain, the running of the bulls. It's the same as NASCAR. Why do you watch? You watch to yeah, see people exactly. get smoked by bulls. 100%. You don't you don't watch to see people safely run across the finish line. My wife is so she doesn't agree with it. Obviously, you know, she's a vegan, but, she's, <laughs> but she gets the popcorn out because she knows of course. That some people are going to get some uh, just desserts. Yeah, the bowls man. Especially. Yeah, man. It's like it's like when when, it, you know, oh, whatever. I don't want to get into this. I was going to say it's like when hunters get attacked by the animals they're hunting. Yeah. And they're just, it's kind of like. I mean, I, I'm sure there's a really sad story out there where a human being died hunting and it's not funny. And I don't want to make light. We're of not it. making light of it. We're yeah. not making fun of it. But it's like when a hunter gets attacked by the animal, it's hunting. It's like, yeah, that's kind of how it works. Play stupid games. When the hunter becomes the hunted. Win stupid prize. Tuesday on Real Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Park Power is like, oh, you got to pick. You got to make us the ones that you know, come out of this back and forth. Well, they're powering our hashtag. And some folks might want to know what hashtag to use if you want to contribute to our conversation through the day. It's Real Talk RJ. Park Power is in the business of electricity, natural gas, and internet. If you bundle all three services with them, you'll save a ton on admin fees. Why do you want to go with Park Power as opposed to the big guys? Well, number one, they take a portion of their profits and plug them back into the nonprofits in their communities. They have a heart for charity, a conviction, if you will. And also, they're gonna knock you know, they're gonna knock 70 bucks off your first bill if you use the promo code 2022 real talk when you sign up at parkpower.ca. Our friends at Local Environmental want to remind you that whether this is a one-time deal, you need something like, you know, portable toilets and fencing for a festival you're putting together, or, or maybe you need a, a longer-term solution. Maybe you're an entrepreneur. Maybe you run a business. You're not unhappy. You don't feel like you're getting a great deal with your garbage collection. Why don't you keep it local and get a quote today at localenvironmental.ca. Don't forget, they sponsor Trash Talk. Every Friday here on the show, you can send us an email if you need to blow off a little steam. And our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge want to remind you, you won't find a better selection of the Chrysler Jeep Ram lineup than you will at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge, including North America's most popular half ton, the 2022 Ram 1500. Of course, they've got the 2500, the 3500, the big duallys. If you're looking to pull a trailer this summer as well, looking to downsize based on fuel cost, they've got you covered there as well with a great pre-owned selection. You can shop them online today. Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge, proud partners here at Real Talk. All right, before we get to Leela here, let's just watch this video one more time. Because, Well, let's watch it 50 more times when she tells us. <laughs> that. I want to watch this one more time to set the table. If you're just joining us right now, if you're just joining us on YouTube in particular, maybe the Mixler live streaming audio app as well. This is the, the Strathmore Stampede. Just as good. The audio is just as good. <laughs> let's roll it. This is the Strathmore Stampede, the running of the bulls just a short time ago. Check this out. So the bulls leaving till it's not. And then something triggers it with this one individual, and the bull starts digging in over the fence, jumps that individual. It's, it's kind of blurry. It's shot on a phone. Who is that individual in the red shirt with the cowboy hat and the jeans? Who was that person that stared down the bull and found a 
happy ending to what otherwise could have been a total disaster. Well, it was none other than Leela oh. Ahir, who wants to be Alberta's next premier, kind enough to join us this morning. What on earth? Have you ever? I mean, what What on earth, Leela? Where's your head at now? Oh, my goodness. The, to tell you the truth, Ryan, um, I... I was I'm I'm one of those people who ride the fence on this because we all know we all sign waivers going out there to your comments coming into this like we're everybody knows why they're going out there and these are huge animals and massive respect and they're super smart and honestly I just my son actually who's 25 was out on that fence with me and when that young man went down it was just total mama bear mode I didn't think about it I I obviously because I just jumped in and I, I don't know if you saw, there was a couple other fellows that jumped in after I did to remove the, to move the bull. So we could scooch this guy up, but it looked like he was dying under the bull. Yeah. Well, it sure does look like he was going to die under that bull. Mm-hmm. And, but, but I think that the average person would probably, it's always interesting doing these interviews when you ask someone who like saved someone from a burning car or somebody who jumped in and did what you do to, is the, is they go, I don't know. You just in the moment you do it. It's not something you think of ahead of time, but most people I think would be paralyzed with fear. I mean, I think that's fair to say. I mean, can, you know, I mean, the, the, you, you did something pretty remarkable remarkable in all honesty i literally saw him go under i i didn't think about it but i to tell you the truth like i i did that and then i remembered scoo- scooching him up onto the fence but i think i was in such a state of shock afterwards it took me a little while like all of these people were coming around us afterwards and telling us and the other folks that had helped out you know about how we had how we had saved that guy and it was really quite remarkable to see those folks, but I actually didn't believe it initially. I was, I, yeah, I saw a few pictures and I'm like, no, that's not what happened. And then I saw the video the next day and I was like, oh my goodness gracious. Like I, I literally didn't realize that that's what had happened until I saw the video. And I actually, I couldn't, I, I watched it once and then I, I was just shaking my head and my <laughs> My son was like, mom, you actually did that because he was on the fence. You can kind of see him from behind pushing with his arms. And it was just, it was surreal to tell you the truth. I mean, I had, if you want to understand, I have no, I had no desire ever to jump in front of a bull. Okay. I grew up in Chestermere. I'm not a farm girl. I mean, I helped out on the farm, but that's not my wheelhouse by any stretch of the imagination. I was out there purely to ride that fence and to, you know, maybe take a step out into the dirt. Those bulls were, were really ornery that day and they're so smart and we're giving out. No, no, keep going. Keep going. We're just showing the video again, Layla. Leela, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can. Oh, yeah. sorry. We didn't mean, yeah, we were just rolling the video while you were talking there. That's but you were okay. saying, yeah, no, they're no, smart animals. Okay. <laughs> and then we, like, we literally were on the fence because they, they give you, like, this set of rules. Do you want to know the most hilarious part? Huh. I'm also a vegetarian. So that <laughs> ran through my head. Like, like I'm, I'm thinking to myself, obviously, like, obviously, you know, they're going to. But most importantly, like, I'm a rule follower. Like, they told us we're not allowed to touch the animals. Well, yeah. So here I am jumping off the fence i put my hand on the bull's head now it looks like a millisecond to you it felt like 10 minutes to me i could tell you exactly what that bull's hair felt like i saw the horns i'm like oh my word how do i move this because he feels like a small vehicle it's like pushing against a car and then that's all i remember of that part and then i remember scooching him out and getting him onto the fence when i actually saw the video and like the four seconds that it actually happened in it felt like 10 minutes when it was actually going on. Well, I remember hearing a story once of a, of a hunter uh, who encountered a bear and survived. Obviously we heard the story, but yeah, his recollection of it in telling it back, he talked about the bear's breath. Like he talked, yeah. he talked about the heat of it. He wasn't like, he wasn't like, oh, the, yes. the, the, you know, the claws and the teeth. He was like, he was like no. the, the heat of the breath was what just still gives him chills. It gives me chills recounting it. What do you, what do you remember? Like, yeah, tell us about, you said you can remember what his hair felt like. You remember like literally what yeah. is it? What's a bull like 1500 pounds, 2000 pounds. It's massive. And it's pissed off. It, exactly. And we all know why we're there. Okay. Like, like I said to you earlier, I mean, we're, we all sign waivers. We're all told what, and, and like, like your friend was saying before he came on, everybody I think is kind of cherry on the bulls at the beginning. Right. So, of course. you know, like that makes complete sense. Right. And so, 
honestly, do you ever, you know what I was thinking about afterwards? Do you ever remember that Bugs Bunny cartoon where the bull is, is, is like steaming up his tail? Do you remember that? And you can hear that, that. I don't know if you guys remember that. This is like totally from my childhood. And it was completely like that. Like I could, I could feel the breath of his, yeah. his nose on my hands. I had my hands firmly planted. I thought on his head, although in that video, it's like a millisecond and I could, see his horns and I kept thinking how do we get this boy out from underneath this bull and then you're pushing against it going this is like trying to move a vehicle like what was I thinking and then that's it the whole rest of it is completely gone from my memory other than what I saw in the video and then they gave me a Pepsi afterwards because I, I literally think I was in a bit of shock a Pepsi afterwards. yeah do you drink yeah do you do you, I, I, I don't know if you drink. No, I, I oh, okay. don't drink at all. Well, then that's I, I, okay. Yeah, was, okay. I yeah, was going to say sure. you deserve four fingers of Crown Royal in that Pepsi. But if you well, don't drink, then okay. <laughs> that young man, I think, was drinking on my behalf. <laughs> yeah. <in Tampa> yeah, <laughs> I think so. I mean, imagine that's the that's the other interview you want uh, here. We need to get the two of yes. you together. That's what we'll oh, do. We'll goodness. do a we'll do a real talk special episode podcast so we can, the three of us can go for lunch and just I can't even imagine <laughs> like imagine him imagine you're on your back like you're on your shoulder blades and this yeah. thing is just I mean I just think it's wild um, if I can say and now that everybody's okay we can joke about this kind of thing if I am your campaign manager I am loving this this is unbelievable for your leadership you didn't cook this up did you Leela you didn't make this happen did you. <laughs> You yeah, didn't, not you didn't in, train not that bull, my... did you? That's not your bull, is it? <laughs> my bull. Yes, his name is Harold. <laughs> his name is Harold. I raised him since. Yikes! I raised him since he yep. was new. Yeah. Yeah, he lives in my backyard. He's actually really friendly. You can come over and pat him. Perfect. Yeah, I'll go ahead and get. Yeah, Have yeah, himself. yeah. Well, yeah, I, I heard that uh, if if anything happens, you just jump in there. Uh, but no, but hey, in all seriousness. This leadership campaign's been kind of an interesting one. I was I was talking about a brief commentary. Uh, I hope you have a couple of minutes here. I know we asked you to talk I, about the bull, but pe for you. Pe people are going to go. What you didn't talk any politics with, or what the hell? So obviously we got to get into this. This this is a nice little boost, and um, and obviously it's gonna it's gonna earn you some some credibility in in the the rural circuit on the rodeo circuit, which is kind of a big deal if you want to be a popular politician uh, in Alberta as well. It's it's been a leadership campaign that's been somewhat characterized by by this angsty against Ottawa vibe and a couple of the you know high profile candidates here are promising that they're going to rattle their sabers and do war with Ottawa you haven't been doing as much on that front if you sort of had to describe a ways into this campaign now what the Leela Ahir campaign is all about what's your primary focus what do you want people to perceive your campaign to be all about that it's all about them that's not about me at all this leadership races and leadership's not about the person that's leading. It's actually about the person, people that they're listening to. And people are craving honest conversation. It's really interesting, Ryan, because I was at that stampede the entire weekend and we had volunteers and we were just, we were working really hard because these are super wonderful people. And we were in Edmonton and all over the place and in Marta Loop for the hockey tournament that they had there. And it was interesting because um, people started talking about the bull thing and it started lots of conversations, which was lovely, but it wasn't the breadth of the conversation what people were talking about is they actually want somebody to stand with them and beside and have Albertans at the core of what's going on it's not our our policies that we're going to be bringing forward are not going to be about what a Leela here government would do it's about what Albertans have been telling us because we are surrounded by savvy intelligent wonderful people people with solutions we've been talking to nurses and doctors and teachers and doing a lot of really heavy duty groundwork to earn respect back after some of the schmozzle that we've put everybody through mm. and at the very very least Ryan this has been a listening campaign and an engaging campaign where our ground game is significantly different. I'm not interested if I'm going to jump into the ring with something like a bull. I'm you're, you're doing that out of respect for that animal and trying to save life. That's completely different. And you do that out of complete instinct. Right. But political instinct has to come from a place of listening and consent and talking and having conversations. People are done with the rhetoric. I will never, ever again put a line in the sand for some sort of um, uh, ideological rhetoric that is left or right. I'm interested in good policy. I'm interested in talking it out with people. We've met thousands and thousands of folks. And the, the way that the campaign is going is so, it's very holistic. And it's very grassroots because we're a teeny tiny team playing in this, you know, pool with the with the big guys. But 
the the average Albertan gets us and understands us because we get them. We're not in it to try and be some big purveyor of policy that we're going to come top down with. People are done with that. They're done with um, the fighting between the left and the right. I will not participate in that. And further to that, I'm mostly interested in making sure that you have a government that you can be proud of. Um, I've been part of a government that's made a lot of mistakes. We owe people a lot of explanations and understanding about things. And we have to fix some stuff, too. And you can you can you know that I'll stand up. You know, I'm not afraid to do that. So when it's needed, when when the bullies are there, we'll take care of that. But we do it collectively together as Albertans. I, I am not we want to put together organize groups of people like we have 300,000 francophones in Alberta. Can you imagine if we put together a team of people that were there to build relationships and bridges with Quebec and a, and a group that was there to build bridges and relationships with Ontario, that their sole purpose was about elevating Alberta and the Alberta spirit. Hmm. And that's what you see that comes together in places like these rodeos. That's that's who Alberta is. Or when you're in the cities and you see folks coming together to help each other and bringing water to everybody in the crowd. And that's what I see every single day, that spirit. And I'm not going to be pointing fingers at people, or organizations or or, um, you know, our institutions. It's our job to try and help fi fix the structural and systemic changes. There's so many. There's so much work to do. But let's get to work. Let's figure out the solutions. Let's find out what the structural issues are and the systemic issues, because we have a responsibility to do that. And I'm really, really excited to get to work with everybody. If you were premier uh, right now, or if you if you would have been premier over the you know the past couple of years, everybody's talking about the uh, chief medical officer of health in Alberta, Dr. Dina Hinshaw's bonus. The story broken by Janet French with the CBC. Uh, you know, she earns a base salary of about 365 grand bonused out for another quarter million or so to the tune of a total salary of around 600 grand. The formula works in the sense that certain healthcare mm -hmm. workers, especially the top executives, receive those bonuses for weeks where they worked more than 45 hours. How would you have handled this or how would you handle this? Is it fair? Is it unfair? How would you manage the public facing side of this? Well, you wouldn't have found out about it this way. It would have been obvious. Like if this was the decision, and to tell you quite frankly, I wish I had more insight for you. Ryan, I wasn't part of those discussions. Not that that's an excuse. It's just the honest truth. But here's the difference is that we owe the public and the taxpayer. We're, we're merely stewards of your taxpayer dollars. We don't just get to do these things. We need to make sure that people understand what we're doing and why. The reason why the public is outraged right now is because they don't understand. They don't get it. They're receiving tidbits here and there. People are angry and frustrated. I have to tell you, I worked with Dr. Hinshaw on multiple occasions when, within the ministry to work on cultural outreach. We did um, a whole bunch of series of um, outreach to communities that don't speak English. So we had translators in the room to help people understand the protocols because it was so confusing, right? Especially in the first and second and third wave. Um, and I was so honored and, and also with Dr. Verna Yu and I miss her so much. They were, I just respect them so much. Whether or not that payment is correct, I don't know. Um, all I do know though is that we, we have to be able to justify that to you. And if we can't, then you can imagine how much the frustration continues to go on. But if you want to attack the pay and attack the situation or how it was done, that's fair. Mm. Attacking Dina is completely inappropriate as far as I'm concerned. And um, these are human beings. These are people who have done their job. It's not like she was lobbying for those dollars, at least is not as far as I know. And to make the assumption on again, on the left and the right, that either she was paid off to not do her job or she was overpaid for doing a job that she didn't, you know, you've, you've heard the rhetoric. I want everybody to understand and consider that this was a government decision, not a Dina Hinshaw decision, and that the buck stops with us and our responsibility to explain to you how that all happened. And if the rhetoric is going to go around that somehow she was paid off or that she didn't do her job properly or whatever, that's fine. I would I would love anybody else to come and step into that situation and to try and manage what she was managing at that time. Um, there is no perfect here. She she made mistakes. She apologized for them. There's a lot of things I think that we will find out. But quite frankly, we need to be able to believe in our institutions. So it comes full circle back to what I've been telling you. My entire, you shouldn't have to ask for transparency, Ryan. You should not have to ask for honesty. It was our responsibility to explain this to you in the first place. We let that slide again. We didn't communicate properly. And hence, we're at this rhetoric again of, did she do her job? Is she lying? Was she paid off? All of this stuff doesn't help the Albertans at all. 
and puts us back into a place where we're fighting each other and where the people of Alberta are the collateral damage on the ground. And you, and the and the left and right are using people to instill fear instead of actually helping and to try to understand the situation. Yeah, fair comment. I think a lot of people are probably focusing more or, or refocusing on Alberta's COVID response and the chief medical officer of health and, and for that matter, uh, Alberta's health ministry and the premier is, you know, Alberta's parents have been essentially saying that they feel left behind. It seems like Alberta's, you know, the last province to do anything about vaccines for kids five and under. And obviously that's a big deal for parents. Uh, mm-hmm. and, 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 I, and I don't think you can blame parents for watching no. this distribution happening everywhere else in the country, except for the province that claims that, that it's the one that always has its beans in a row. I was um, so I we were we were reaching out to health every day. We you can imagine the emails we got in our office. So we reached out to health every single day to try and get an update. I again, I have to believe that there's reason I'm you know, I'm not in the inner loop. OK, I'm not on the inner circle. So all I can do is ask and push and make sure that those things are done. I That's think a good place out. to be right now for you. <laughs> Optically, it's a great place to be to be the one. I hey, I'm the one that got kicked out of my ministry. I'm the one that the, that the premier didn't want to you know throw a bone to anymore. It looks pretty good on you now. Well, but it's the right thing to do. Like you, you don't stay in those ministries to be complicit and quiet. Our job is to actually advocate for people, right? That's actually our job. So if you get booted for doing your job and for standing for people, so be it. It was never, that was never the priority for me. And you and I've talked about this before. The The priority for me is making sure that people have a voice with us, right? We're, we're supposed to represent you, Ryan. You're supposed to stand on our shoulders, not the other way around. And hmm. the vaccine will, I think Alberta and BC have the same date, right? It's today. Actually, hmm. it's my son's 24th birthday today. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday. Sarah. <laughs> But uh, isn't, I believe BC and Alberta having the same rollout. Am I wrong about mm-hmm. that? Yeah, well, it's right ro- along the same lines, I believe. Yeah. I, we've been paying most attention to Alberta, to be honest. Yeah. So just, just to give some clarity to that. But I, um, I just want to thank, we have a very, very strong advocating public here in Alberta. And as, as much as we might get frustrated that that is the direction that things go, we've always been like that. Like, even if you think back to NDP days with Bill 6 and carbon taxes and all of that, it was truly, truly the movement of the public that helped to determine the way that government went on these things. And I'm so, so proud of the people of Alberta for being vocal and being strong in, in their intent and what they want to do. And this vaccine for these little ones, for the families that want it, is gonna is just gonna be a huge, huge shift for them. There's a lot of families that have seniors that are, you know, that are vulnerable or other family members and having their kids vaccinated for them is just going to be probably such a, a, a relief. So I'm very grateful that it's rolling out. I wish I had an answer for you. But one thing I'll promise you, Ryan, is that I will work harder than anyone else. And I will be as honest as I, as anything with people, with your taxpayer dollars, with facilitating information, with building bridges with our institutions, with not pointing fingers. Like I'm not interested in pointing fingers at AHS or pointing fingers. I'm interested in actually looking at the structural issues and looking at systemic issues. This is not a... T- have we not learned anything not to to point at people and to not I don't think we have learned that. anything actually. I'm not trying oh, to be I, negative. I don't think we've no, learned anything. You're you're right. No. So let's do something different together. Yeah. Let's look at it from the perspective of the people of Alberta want to be respected and heard and understood. The same thing applies for how they feel about Ottawa. But they also want somebody who is willing to negotiate and do that work. Mm -hmm. And there is a tremendous opportunity for that to happen if we're actually willing to do the work and not just yell into space all the time. Yeah. I was thinking you could probably add uh, uh, under the gut, the current government, you want to talk about Albertans advocacy, coal mining on the eastern slopes, the curriculum rewrite. I think those are two other ones where Albertans really dug in their heels. That 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 lawn sign campaign, the protect our parks lawn sign campaign, that was unbelievable. Like that that stuff flares up quick. Um, And I think it gives politicians, probably including yourself, a pretty good sense of what people's priorities look like. Let me ask you this. I know your team's going to want you to go and and we got to run. And time always flies when you and I are chatting. But. But you're fighting a war on two fronts right now, and and I'm not sure that everybody's aware of what's going on, so maybe you can summarize it for us. But you've got this leadership race happening. You want to be Alberta's next premier. Meantime, there's a a fight to control your riding association, your constituency association. That's happening behind the scenes, and we could get into the weeds on all the stuff that's happening that the average person, their eyes would would gloss over. But essentially, is it fair, Leela, to characterize this as, as, as a board that's loyal to you, uh, fighting against or trying to hold off an, an incoming board 
uh, that may want to see a new representative for the riding next time Albertans go to the polls. Is that a fair assessment of what's happening right now? I think what's fair, and you know who you should have on, Ryan? You should have my board president on, John Kittler. Um, he's an amazing human being. There's so much integrity in that board. And they're not, the, I mean, obviously we care about each other. I'm not even, even a voting member on my board. They represent the area of Chestermere and Strathmore. And they are volunteers and they are amazing human beings and deserve to be respected as such. We don't treat our volunteers like this. We treat them with respect and dignity and the board will do what it needs to do. There's been, you know that we already had one one arbitration and you and I can have a different discussion one day about what happened then. But I think if you speak with John Kittler, who's our president, because they represent the people. And technically I actually, other than to do updates for our board, it would be inappropriate for me to speak on their behalf because they're the ones who are really going through this right now. So if I could leave that to you to speak with him to get more clarity on that. But one thing I'll tell you is that um, if, if you're wondering where I get my strength and my passion from, it's the people that, that are of our riding. We have 54,000 amazing human beings in our riding, people I represent. That's your reason for getting up every day. And our board, who are busy human beings who do a thousand other things in their lives, are willing to dedicate hours of their life to the party and to me and to growing this movement in a way that they see is in, is appropriate. And so if I could give one piece of advice to anybody who's going out there, how about we stop attacking people? How about we stop attacking volunteers? How about we start working with people? Um, if a new board wants to try and go in, well, they're going to have to do that with integrity and they're going to have to do that without cheating. And those are really important things. You don't think you have to talk about that? but that's absolutely what needs to happen. But if I could, Ryan, because I know you got to go too, um, I'll send you John Kittler's information and I would highly recommend that you have him on. He'll be able to give you more clarity. about. The sure. Board. You know, I had to ask though. We never know what yeah. you're going to give us here on Real Talk, Lilo, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you want. Hey, uh, I, I don't even know. You're probably still in a little bit of shock over everything that happened there at, at the stampede at the Strathmore stampede. I can't even imagine the, the, the number of times over the next six months that people are going to ask you to retell that story. Uh, thanks for making us one of your first stops. We appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. And uh they say, hey, don't be jumping in, into any, in front of any bulls. Okay? Well, geez. Yeah, that's no, I, I promise I won't. I promise I won't. I can't imagine a circumstance where I would, although you never know. Right, Johnny? People could have said people could have said to Leela, or thanks to Leela here for joining us, they could have said to her a week ago, don't go jumping in front of any bulls, and she would have laughed. And then a few days later, wow. You wouldn't try to save me if I was getting attacked by a bull ride? Sorry, bud. Come on. I'd be like, yeah, bully, bully. Hey. <laughs> you know? And then I throw some. John, I'm trying. <laughs> throw your throw some beer and your hot some, dog at him or throw, something like <laughs> Get out of here, bull! Here, bull! Over here! Oh, good to know. No, of course you would. Of course, of course, I would jump in to save your life. I want to see. I'm just gonna watch that video thirty more times today. Right? Yeah, yeah, thirty more times. Unbelievable. Yeah, everybody on the chat. Yeah, you're not getting an answer on that one on the CA thing. That's yeah, it's because mm -hmm. it's actually pretty nasty, and uh, it's been a nasty fight. And obviously, lawyers are involved, and of course, she's not going to comment. But you got to ask the question. You never know, right? But uh, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Who knows? If we if we have that uh, Kittler on, we'll we, you know, we'll get the other representatives as well. Maybe they'll come on together. Although I really doubt it. Uh, I suspect that won't happen. A lot of this stuff happens in politics behind the scenes, and the, the general mm -hmm. public's not aware of it. But these are these are the strings that are pulled, right? Yep. And everybody really competing for power, and uh, of course, all of this. The stakes are high. The leadership race for the conservatives. You've got the NDP retooling as well. You know, obviously, they want to start. I mean, you're always campaigning, mm -hmm. but really, you know, the election's coming up next year. You're going to see things ramp up in the next few months until a full blown campaign. The writ is dropped. And then obviously it's going to be, I think I, I, I've seen a couple of people commenting on how they love seeing this. They love that that elections will be competitive mm -hmm. in Alberta. Right. It's good. I think I think a competitive political landscape is good for a population. Mm -hmm. right? And I know it's fiery right now with the Daniel Smith stuff. But you, could you imagine like Smith versus Notley? Could you imagine that? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I try to imagine that anything. would be a war. It would be. Yeah. I mean, it would just be a really. Yeah. I mean, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I give anybody V anybody. Um, we've had the sort of Brian Jean Notley tangos before. Yes. Right. 
uh, never with Brian as the leader of a united conservative movement. Uh, Daniel Smith obviously was, uh, you know, would have intersected with Rachel Notley at the Alberta legislature, but Notley would have been part of the, at that time, you may have described it as the fledgling NDP, right? Okay, yeah. Remember in 2015, they went from four seats to 54 overnight. Mm-hmm. I always think when I use the word overnight, their campaign managers are like, there was actually a lot of work involved in that, you know. Remember, they called it the Orange Crush. The Orange Crush. <laughs> we'll see what happens next year in Alberta. You can always let us know what you think. In the meantime, every Tuesday, our friends at Leading Edge Physiotherapy give us an opportunity to celebrate something positive that's happening. Sometimes it's innovation. Sometimes it's impact in community. And this week, we celebrate what's happening at the Strathcona Community Hospital. This is Leading Edge Physiotherapy's Charity of the Month for the month of August. Now, this is an innovative facility, relatively new, delivering primary health care um, combined with community services, a 24-hour emergency department. It's made a huge impact in that community with regards to availability of emergency and other care. What we really celebrate today on The Leading Edge is how they're using artwork to impact people who are navigating their way through a difficult health journey. Four massive paintings by celebrated artist Giselle Denis have given people an opportunity to to take their focus somewhere away from the challenges that can come with a battle with cancer or what have you. This legacy mural was created by Giselle, revealed in the hospital lobby. The funding started to be collected uh, following the passing of Carol Lesniak, who's the wife of the Hospital Foundation's board chair, Ken Lesniak, spent a number of nights in that facility as a cancer patient. Now, proceeds from the Oilers Community Foundation 50-50 draw have also helped the hospital. Proceeds going towards this art. And it's personal for the artist, too. Giselle Denis with this to say about the contribution to the cause. My theme in all my work is hope. And I think any, everyone can identify with that. Hope gives you, like you know, positive um, thoughts and and plans to move ahead, moving forward and, and something to look forward to. We all need something to look forward to. My own father's suffering with cancer right now and so it's been a struggle. It's like a lot of art healing and art therapy when I create. This gives me hope and desire to move forward. I think that's such a beautiful focus that she has there. Art and hope and positivity. That mural project by Giselle Denis at the Strathcona Community Hospital has them in the spotlight in this week's edition of The Leading Edge. Presented by Leading Edge Physiotherapy, life shouldn't hurt. Johnny, did you see this story out of uh, Vancouver? This was uh, Linda Steele. You know, we had her on the show a few weeks ago with Jody Vance. They're getting set to roll out their new show, Steele and Vance. This is horrible. On Czech TV. (laughs) This is well, the story's not quite as bad as I thought it was originally because I thought that people were slashing tires. That's what I thought too at first. But it turns out that this environmental activist group, uh, known as the tire extinguishers, has not been slashing tires, but they've been deflating them. They've flattening. been flattening the tires. <laughs> Which is, which is, which is, it is, it is different. Still annoying. It's still annoying. They flattened the tires, they say, on 34 SUVs in Victoria and Oak Bay on the island. Linda Steele reporting this out of Vancouver, saying this is just the beginning. They say that direct action works. Uh, they say, attention, your gas guzzler kills. They left these uh, printouts on the, under the windshield wipers of the SUVs, uh, which, which the, the tires they deflated. They, they say, you'll be angry, but don't take it. Personally, it's not you, it's your car. We did this because driving around urban areas in your massive vehicle has huge consequences for others. They say you'll have no difficulty getting around without your gas guzzler, walking, cycling, or public transport. They say keep in mind driving hybrid or electric are still polluting cars. They're still dangerous and cause congestion. You can see more on their website, (laughs) tireextinguishers.com. Oh, boy. Now, it's true. Okay. Direct action does work because it has people talking about the story. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I do think that it's a little. Do I want to say more OK or a little less on? Un- Un- careful, okay. Careful yeah, I want to I want to be careful how I navigate this one. If they were slashing the tires, it's a totally different story. It'd be brutal. I'll tell you right now. I, I agree with what they're saying a little. But if I came out to come to Real Talk. In the morning, and my tires were flattened, no matter what I was driving, 
I would be screaming to high heaven <laughs> and cursing these people, no matter who they are. And I'm wondering this, like, to deflate no a car what tire. Cause. So we, uh, when we go, uh, this is gonna, this is like a great little segue. When we go off roading, uh, <laughs> these people are just like, "You son of a!" Uh, but I will say, we, we, you call it airing down, mm. and off road enthusiasts will know about this, especially if you, if, if you're not lucky enough to trailer your vehicle out mm-hmm. to where you're going to be exploring. If you have to drive it out, you have to have your tires properly inflated on the highway, of course, for safety's sake, for fuel efficiency. But you don't want to have your tires fully inflated when you're rock crawling yeah, or when you're touring, better right? Better grip, yeah. Yeah, you better grip, and you, you, know, you need your tires to be able to have some, some ability to navigate some of the uneven terrain, and so you air down. Mm-hmm. To air an SUV tire down, especially to flatten it, takes quite some time. It does. Like That's you got to think like, And how? it's just like, for like how long? Five, six, seven minutes? Like these tire people, do they have jobs? Because this, this is like... It's like an eight-hour shift they put in doing this to all these cars. Yeah, so you wonder what's going to happen uh, the first time one of them gets caught doing this. It's not going to be good. To the wrong person. It's going to be a lot like that bull. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you would be okay with it, though. I mean, if, 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 if you caught them in the act and, 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 and if they explained themselves and I said, listen, we're trying, to, we're, we're trying to do something that will grab the attention of whatever. Yeah. You know what's going to happen, though, is that somebody's going to have an, a medical emergency or something they're going to need exactly. to get to the hospital right thinking. away. Or they're going to miss a job interview and they've been trying to yeah. get a job for a year and a half. And they're going to give a tearful interview to the local news station. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, the tire extinguishers are going to be public they're enemy number be one if they're not already. If I came out and they were there with a vehicle, I'd be like, cool, just give me your keys. Here's my address. Yeah, what I'll do you be think at the they Real Talk do. Studios? Do you think they head into the neighborhoods? They they flatten all the tires and then they just go and sit at the bus stop and wait for the bus to arrive in 40 minutes. So I get see out this of there? as being a a bike gang, a mountain a, bikes, a cycle and, gang, yeah, a cycle gang. <laughs> so they can, uh, but not mountain bikes. Mountain bikes are too sort of like mainstream. These you have to have the uh, <laughs> they kind have of the, the hipster. They, you know they have like the, the sort of Dutch style, the Dutch style pedestrian bikes with the ha- the handles up high, tire right? Flattening. And not and not wearing helmets. They Unicycle don't cycle gang. Yeah, they, <laughs> what, sure. what would you do? What would you do if you caught them? If you caught them in your driveway as you're going to work or you're oh, going I mean, out I'd, to get groceries? You know, I'd, pro- I'd probably just you know give them a glass of water and wish them well and thank them for their service to Mother Earth. Is that what you? <laughs> What would I do? Okay. What would I do? <laughs> Fuck around and find out what I would do. <laughs> Our friends oh, at Eden Landscaping man. want to remind you that this, although we're already halfway through the summer, this is your reminder that it's never too late. Never too late. Do not allow yourself to do what I do, which is to put everything in your life. I'll just wait till next year. I guess I'll just wait till next week. I'll do it tomorrow. Today is a perfect time to take the next step toward bringing your outdoor space to life with Eden Landscaping. You've dreamed. You have that envy. The folks down the street have that big boulder with the house number on it. How good does that look? Hey, or what about that water feature from the folks down the block? Doesn't that add to the curve? appeal then what about you heard that story about the people that had that birthday or anniversary celebration their outdoor kitchen firing out pizzas in 90 seconds flat that can be your reality mike and his team custom landscape builders with more than two decades of experience you can check out their portfolio the projects that they've executed to perfection online at landscape edmonton Ca. And a big shout out to our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. If you follow me on Instagram, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you probably saw over the weekend. And I'm going to save that content exclusively for our Instagram followers. A Minions birthday cake, the classic oh, Dairy this. Queen <laughs> ice cream cake for our little guy, Wyatt, as he celebrated his seventh birthday. That was from the Dairy Queen in Palisades. They did an unbelievable job. Our thanks to them for making Wyatt's dreams come true. He wanted that Minions birthday cake. A reminder, the signature Stack Burger collection, worth your time any day. The Bacon Two Cheese Deluxe is the Jespo choice of the week at the Dairy Queens and Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. You let out this big sigh where I said, if you follow me on Instagram, and then you let out this big sigh. Because we should have had the picture. 
That's that's I why to I to reserve I the content. Song. This is a it's a tease. Oh, so this is a lead this is our, to. It's a lead to. Okay. It's a reminder. You can follow me, mm-hmm. you, mm-hmm. and the show mm-hmm. on Instagram mm-hmm. at Real Talk RJ, Johnny Infamous, and Ryan Jesperson. There it is, right and there. And that's where you'll find exclusive content for our Instagram followers, including highlights from Real Talk interviews. He's pointing at the screen for those of you that are listening to the podcast. This story out of Positive Reflections, I mean, I've, uh, this one was submitted by a couple of different uh, real talkers, and I hadn't seen it. This was uh, an, an absolutely unimaginable circumstance. There's this little guy, okay? Uh, he's uh, out of Staten Island. His name is Messiah Brown. And, uh, Johnny, here, we can, just, we can just take the video here, and we'll roll this if you're watching us on YouTube. This is from Fox 5. This is courtesy of Fox 5 in New York. Messiah's seven years old, okay? Mm-hmm. And so this, by the way, is presented by our friends at Kubi Energy, every for you know the first show of every week, we focus on a positive reflection, something that, that can make our day and and restore our faith in humanity. So Messiah, he's in Sacramento, California, right? And uh, he goes out. There's a pool where they live, and he went out to enjoy the apartment complex pool, and he noticed something out of the ordinary. John, you're going to get chills when I say this. So he walks out. He's seven years old. He looks and he sees a boy at the bottom of the pool. What? There's nobody else there. There's nobody else there, and this seven-year-old is pretty sure that he sees a little boy at the bottom of the pool. And so he dives in, sure enough, swims down six feet, Wow! swims down six feet, grabs the arm of a three-year-old toddler whose eyes and mouth were open. Okay, he pulls him to the surface, and then one of Messiah's cousins, uh, Savannah, who's nine years old, help, they help get this three-year-old out onto solid ground. And that's when adults understand what's happening. There's obviously screaming for help. They call 911. Savannah, her mom, performs CPR on the child, and by the time that Sacramento's fire department arrived, this three-year-old toddler was breathing again. Wow. This is an unbelievable story. A seven-year-old who noticed something just didn't seem right and did something about it. Now, Messiah's dad, Marcus, is actually an Olympic boxer. He represented the U.S. in London in 2012. He said, yeah, our son swims like a fish. And he says, he says, aside from the remarkable circumstance of him saving a life unprompted, Mm -hmm. he says he's super empathetic. And so it's really nothing out of the norm. So we wanted to give a huge shout out to Messiah Brown, seven years old, who noticed something was wrong and did something about it, saving the life of a three-year-old. I'm sure they will be boy. forever friends. Isn't that incredible. wild? That's incredible. You know, when I, served, when I saw this, and I want to give a shout out to the Real Talkers that passed this along. There were a couple different ones of you that sent us the story. We love when you send us your positive reflections to talk at ryanjesperson.com. It reiterated to me as well the importance of getting those young kids comfortable in the water. Yeah. You know, totally. I know a lot of families do the official swimming lessons. A lot of other families, you know, take it on, their, on, on, on themselves. They make sure the kids have the, the floaties and the appropriate supporting stuff so they can feel comfortable in the water at the beginning Mm -hmm. but a story like this just reminds you how important it is for kids to be able to tread water for a little bit to go under the water and have their eyes covered with their mouth and to understand you know what that is have you ever seen the videos of like the 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 18 months old of course the, the little toddlers they can train them to flip over in the water yeah it's amazing what kids can do uh, with just some exposure to the proper training and coaching. And, it's beautiful. Oh, man, you get a sick feeling in your stomach of what could have been. Yeah. Uh, but how about Messiah, seven years old? And, and the irony of the name is lost on absolutely nobody, right. obviously. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> that's not lost on anybody. Live you it can up send to us it. your positive reflection to talk at ryanjesperson.com, and you can get your free solar quote today at kubienergy.com. CA. Coming up tomorrow, we're looking forward to our conversation with former BC Premier Christy Clark. We expect it's going to be Thursday that we'll talk to Jean Charest on the heels of that leadership debate. In the meantime, make it a great day, friends. Enjoy this beautiful August weather, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer Josh Dunford. Technical producer, John Hicks. General manager, Katie Cook Chivers. Account coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human resources, Lena Shepard. Website design, Mike Johnston. Voiceover by me, Perry Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandi Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, 
Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a Relay Project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.